Um, thank you very much for having me. I am currently in Australia uh, and it is currently 5 a.m., which is a lot earlier than I usually wake up, but I will do a lot of things for WP Campus because I love that conference and I really wanted to um, uh, go to New Orleans one. I had it all planned when it got cancelled. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry I can't be with you there now. Uh, so, first off, um, uh, firstly, meet our team. This is getting to be an old photo. Um, I sort of feel like time stopped in 2020, uh, but this was taken in 2018, about two thirds of our team at the time. Uh, and when I started Accessibility Oz, it, as you know, if you've seen any presentations from me before, I wanted to support people with disabilities um, by uh, providing employment opportunities, uh, as well as, of course, you know, making websites accessible and testing and things like that. Now, if you look at us, we don't look like we have any kind of, you know, uh, significant disabilities. There's a guy there with uh, uh, glasses. He is actually blind. Uh, but we also have a whole bunch of other people with disabilities, including dyslexia, moderate vision impairment, epilepsy, migraines, severe vision impairment, physical impairment, post-traumatic stress disorder, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, long COVID, ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so the one thing to remember uh, if you're fairly new to accessibility is it's not just about vision Im impairments. A lot of people, especially developers, <clears throat> Uh, think that it has to do only with screen reader accessibility. That is absolutely not the case. The largest group of people with disabilities who use the web are actually people with cognitive disabilities because they are the largest group of people with disabilities. Um, and so it's important to think of all users when talking about accessibility. So a little bit about me. Uh, I started in 1998, which is a really long time ago. Um, I worked on the first accessible website in Australia, uh, created Australia's first automated accessibility testing tool in 2000, uh, spent six years as an invited expert to the W3C WCAG2 working group. I worked on the Melbourne 2006 Commonwealth Games and all Commonwealth Games since then. Uh, managed usability and accessibility services at Monash University. So when it comes to uh, higher education, I feel your pain. I founded Accessibility Oz in 2011. We released Oz Player in 2013 and OzArt in 2014. I spoke at the United Nations on the importance of web accessibility in 2015 and uh, was the it was inducted into Australia's Hall of Fame as Accessibility Person of the Year in 2019. And I am, and for the last few years, being the chair of the Mobile Accessibility Testing Guidelines. So uh, that's why you should listen to me. <clears throat> For those new to accessibility, uh, just a brief overview of accessibility. It is basically the ability for a person with a disability to understand and use a website, application, internet, mobile app program, basically anything technical. Uh, it's governed by the Department of Justice uh, OCR, uh, Office of Civil Rights, Section 508, Section 504, CVAA, etc. But basically you can make sure that your technical content is accessible by following the W3C Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And we're up to version 2.2, uh, though only 2.1 has been endorsed uh, by most countries at this point. Why is it important? It allows people with disabilities to access information like anybody else. So, for example, someone who has, uh, you know, some kind of significant uh you know, disability like a quadriplegia or paraplegia, they can go online, do their grocery shopping, which is something that they won't necessarily be able to do in person. It also allows them to interact with others without being categorised as disabled. And this is really important because there's still a huge amount of discrimination against people with disabilities. Um, 
you have movies like Million Dollar Baby and Me Before You, where someone's disability is apparently so horrendous that they end up taking their own lives, when this wouldn't be accepted when we start talking about other minority groups uh, like uh, race or gender or sexuality. So it is really important that people can uh, interact with others without disclosing their disability. And this is especially important in higher education. There may be a fear that it might affect their prospects, their job prospects, or, you know, they might just feel that they'll get treated differently. And that feeling is very accurate because um, there's a video uh, of this woman who is, a little bit old now but she's playing second life and she went into second life multi um player game as a normal person and uh went to a club talked to lots of people had a great time and then of course in second life you can mimic a number of dis different disabilities and she's uh quadriplegic and so she went into second life again and she went in uh, as a person with a wheelchair and she was completely ignored so once again you know this is um you're kind of ridiculous if you think about it, but it deal, does still happen. So that ability to interact with others without being categorised as disabled is really important. And um, undertake activities which they're not otherwise able to do. So I got the two switched up. This is the grocery store one. Uh, the access information, like anyone else, you know, following the elections, that kind of stuff. Uh, people with disabilities can easily do that via the web now. Um, as long as the content is accessible, uh, they can access, you know, campus courses, et cetera, uh, in a way that they couldn't necessarily do if everything was physical. Uh, and it, we're talking about a lot of people. So uh, 1 billion people with disabilities worldwide. And so that's approximately 20% of um, people with disabilities uh, across the population, whether it's first world countries or, um, developing countries, uh, you know, it's 20% sort of seems to be the percentage. And so when we're talking about people with disabilities, uh, there's basically five different groups, those that are affecting vision, uh, affecting how the mind interprets information, affecting movement, affecting hearing and affecting mental health. Um, and mental health uh, issues are not covered in the web content accessibility guidelines, uh, but there is some good research about that. And it really has to do, uh, just as an aside, about uh, providing as appropriate accommodations. So one of the biggest accommodations provided to people who have mental health disabilities, uh, you know, say ADHD or PTSD, um, is providing the ability to listen to music during exams. So uh, that kind of can calm people down or provide them with a um, kind of a, uh, a way to get into a particular state of mind that they might not be able to do if there's complete silence in, you know, an exam room. So, Let's talk about the accessibility roadmap for tertiary institutions. So the first thing I want to say is that this presentation is based on a paper I presented um, at a, the Applied Human Fa Factors and Ergonomics Conference in campus in, sorry, <laughs> in Hawaii last year. Um, unfortunately, I did not get to go to Hawaii, uh, but, uh, you know, I wish I did, but the um, uh, paper is easily downloadable here uh, so that provides quite a lot of information and if you have any trouble just reach out to me um, and I can send you a copy. I'm just going to turn my microphone off when I hit while I just uh, cough a little bit. Okay let's better. So why is accessibility different for higher ed? So I I really loved my time at Monash University. Uh, it was uh, kind of a great job, very easy in some ways and incredibly difficult in others. Uh, but I felt there was a real community around higher education that I didn't feel there was when I worked in private industry. So in higher education, there are many disparate units doing many different things and, you know, it, you say the left hand doesn't know the right what the right hand is doing. It's like, you know, there's just so many hands, like there's so many people doing so many things. There's absolutely no way to keep track of them all, though you think there would be, 
but there really isn't. There's all types of technology. Um, you know, there's e-commerce, there's different content management systems. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things. And you might have a really, you know, tight hold on what all the faculties are doing, but then there'll be like some spin-off like committee and they'll just decide to build their own thing. Uh, so it's really hard to keep track of all that. And on top of that, you're doing amazing work and huge amounts of work and outputting, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of content. And then you have these teeny tiny budgets. So I remember uh, doing work for uh, BHP Billiton and their website was 95 pages and they had a budget that was larger than the Faculty of Arts had for their entire website, uh, web everything, not just their website, but their learning management system, everything. And so, you know, it's just, it's this weird world um, that I don't think anyone really understands unless they've been in it. So what do you do? Uh, so the first thing is kind of phase A, which I call quick wins, because it's really important to show some quick wins as soon as possible so that people can get on board the accessibility train. Um, so I've implemented all of these things in a variety of different places. Uh, so uh, the first step is build an accessibility committee. Uh, so we had an accessibility committee at Monash and sometimes things often got stalled until we had that committee meeting and all of a sudden things happened. And that committee meeting uh, should can, uh, include any accessibility people that are on staff. Uh, then it should also include, you know, like your head of IT, um, your head of the LMS, um, you know, your faculty heads, that kind of stuff. And they do, you know, complain and moan about how to, they have to go to another committee meeting. But it is really important uh, because it also gives you an opportunity to educate these people. So don't just bring people together who know um, all about accessibility, bring people together who need to know about accessibility. So you can say, bring, you know, us on to do an accessibility basic session, or you can bring them all together and say, hey, watch, watch this webinar from WP Campus. So it's a really good way to educate uh, people who really should know about accessibility. The second step is um, develop a disability reference group. And so this is a group that uh, consists of people with disabilities in your organisation, and they should include students as well as staff. Um, now, it would be love lovely if they rem were remunerated for their time, but of course, that's not often the case. Um, and that disability reference group should be involved with the accessibility committee reporting to them or, um, you know, part of the committee. And so this disability reference group is something that I've seen I've implemented, not just in tertiary institutions, but also in other really large institutions like uh, councils. So Brisbane City Council, one of the largest uh, council in Australia, uh, had, you know, these great websites, our Brisbane and, um, you know, the Brisbane City Council website. Uh, they had a huge number of people working on the web and they were, you know, they were doing really great. They brought me on. I, you know, did a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things I did was develop a disability reference group. And so... Then, you know, they got a new mayor and the mayor just laid off everyone, every man and his dog. And the one thing that was left was the disability reference group. And so 16 years later, when I was um, asked to come back <coughs> and rebuild everything that I had built 16 years before, the one thing that was still going was the disability reference group. And the reason why they actually engaged Accessibility Oz is because there, was there were people still on that group that had been around when I um, uh, started it 16 years prior. And so that reference group, at the very least, is a group that people can listen to. So um, can say, hey, we've just you've just implemented this LMS and the login button doesn't have an accessible name. And of course, you know, one student or a bunch of students complaining about that doesn't mean anything. But if a disability reference group um, does, you know, says something, then sometimes these things can, well, these things do actually change. So that's a really good thing to implement as well. Um, then step three is appoint an accessibility champion. 
So basically the accessibility champion is the repository of all knowledge. Be great if this was a full-time role, but it really can't be in most places. Uh, but it's someone who is the source of truth because when it comes to accessibility uh there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing things and uh people say well which is the right way you know can you have more than one h1 on a page and i'm like well you know i think you can but a lot of people think you can't so having that one person that says okay this is what we're doing in this organization and this is the one person that you can send to conferences and can do presentations to the accessibility committee that can talk to the technical people often it is a technical person but then can um translate that to the actual executive, uh, someone who knows that their role is to stand up and say, this is not working. Uh, and step four, I, I think is uh, really important is to hire additional disability services staff. And it's really important to, of course, have some disability services staff in your accessibility committee, but also really try and promote what it is the disability services staff um, do. And they're really at the coalface. So they hear um, the complaints. They, you know, know they've had 15 emails this week um, because, you know, a video didn't have captions, etc. And the interesting thing about disability services staff is I've found throughout the uh, tertiary organisations that I've worked for, and I've worked for probably about 50 um, uh, through Accessibility Oz and worked at Monash University, is that there's, especially from faculty, a real fear of disability services stuff. And so um, I did some work for Montgomery Campus Community College and I stood up in front of faculty they were forced to attend they did not like it um and you know I did an accessibility basics thing and I talked about you know what it is that they needed and we had two uh faculty uh, uh stand up and talk about how there was one person who was blind uh, sorry one person who had a student who was blind who taught music and the student didn't know how to read braille and the 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 lecturer had no idea how to teach the music without you know, actually showing them, you know, um, you know, written music or converting it into Braille. And they had not contacted disability services. And when they were asked why they had not contacted disability services, they said, oh, because they would give us more work to do. And it's like, no, but they might actually help you and, you know, give you less work to do. Uh, so uh, that was the one thing. And the second one was another lecturer who stood up and she had, she taught dance and she had a deaf student in her class. And she once again, didn't know how to, uh, you know, to teach this deaf student. Um, and once again, had not contacted disability services staff. So a, an outreach from disability services is also important to say, hey, you know, we might even tag your PDFs for you. Like if you need a PDF tagged, we won't necessarily say, okay, you guys do that 16 hours of work to tag that PDF. We'll do it for you. So making sure that it's uh, people are aware that those disability services staff are there to assist the lecturers and the students. And then if you don't have the resources um, currently in disability services staff to do things like tagging PDS, then that's where the accessibility committee can come in and say, look, we've got, you know, 15 blind students and they're requesting, you know, the total of 2000 pages being tagged, you know, so what can we do? Um, could we go to Bookshare? Can we outsource it to a company? Uh, can we train someone up? What is it that we can do to actually, um, assist and make sure those things get done. <clears throat> um, then also it's really important to develop accessibility resources. So uh, things like testing tools, social media links, I have a lot of links at the end of this presentation uh, that should hopefully help um, and basically promoting those uh, to the uh, to the faculty, to the community. Uh, and that can be through uh, basically having like lunch and learn sessions at George Mason University. Uh, we decided we'd have one month on alt attributes and every week I think they sent out, uh, you know, like a little kind of 
uh, newsletter on a little bit more about um, alt attributes. And then they had a session at the end of one day where I suggested that they have cocktails. But they said, no, we can't have cocktails. But, you know, basically they provided some food and drink and, uh, you know, had a one hour session on how to write alt attributes. Uh, so those are the things that you can do with existing resources. Uh, and then number six is provide a communication method for staff and students to comment on accessibility. You need to capture the complaints. And once again, this is usually where disability services comes in. Uh, phase B is develop an accessibility plan. So write an accessibility statement. You know, we are going to be accessible. We support people with disabilities, yay. Uh, and get it approved by executive because once they approve that message and then you go to them and you say, hey, we're not accessible, they'll be like, okay, we need to put some money towards this. So there was one organisation where um, I got five minutes with executive to explain how important this stuff is. They, the, the tertiary institution had engaged us with a $10,000 project just to do a high level review of absolutely everything and five minutes to present it to executive. We said, hey, your stuff is inaccessible. This is not good. And they walked away with a um, budget of $1.5 million. So that can that can really help. And the next step is, of course, develop an accessibility action plan. So what it is you're going to do, um, and there's some good uh, resources on the web, especially Accessibility Switchboard, which I talk about a little bit later, um, talks about that. And then add accessibility to thing to tertiary institution policies and procedures. So, you know, there should be stuff in procurement uh, procedures. That's There's also a lot of stuff on Accessibility Switchboard for that. Uh, but also, you know, your social media policies need to talk about how, you know, all your images need to have alt attributes, all your videos need to have captions, etc. And then you need to communicate the accessibility plan changes to tertiary institution policies and procedures. And excuse me for one moment. Okay, phase C make accessibility fixtures, fixes. So you need to, for the first step, make sure all future tertiary institution websites and applications are accessible. You sort of draw a line in the sand and you say, everything from now on will be accessible. And, you know, that might be uh, hiring, you know, hiring someone who can do your accessibility testing, training your testers in accessibility testing, um, you know, coming up with, with RFIs, that kind of stuff. But you draw a line in the sand, you say, from now on, we will uh, make sure it is. And then <coughs> create an inventory of all ICT, I mean, when we did this with one organisation, took us a year and a half, uh, software, websites, classroom technologies, videos. I mean, it, it, can, it can take a long, long time, but you need to know, you know, what everything is. And then you look at those and you identify the websites and applications to be tested. And I know that's a big deal, but basically you look at something that has a three-week life, uh, life um a three week life and you're one and a half weeks in and you're like, okay, look, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to put a um, something at the bottom that says, if you have a problem, contact us. Okay. Here's the, you know, disability action plan. We need that to be hundred percent accessible because we know that people who access the disability action plan will be people with disabilities. So you can actually pass, um, you know, the content in that way. Uh, and then, to conduct testing, uh, you need to really, uh, as a tertiary institution with, you know, so much content, you really do need to purchase an automated accessibility testing tool. There's lots of them out there. Um, and that at least can uh, cover the 30% of uh, accessibility errors that can be identified um, through, you know, automation. <laughs> and then conduct vendors, contact vendors. So, you know, most of the things or some of the things that you use in tertiary institutions are third party um, systems. So actually reach out to them and ask them, hey, do you have a VPAT? Look at the VPAT. I have a webinar on how to read a VPAT to determine whether it's um, viable or not. Um, I'm speaking at WordPress Accessibility Day on that particular topic. Uh, and so you can look at that, even if you don't have a lot of in, um, knowledge about accessibility and reach out to the vendors and say, hey, what are you doing to fix these issues? 
And then step six is undertake test uh, fixes. One moment. And phase D is provide training uh, for web staff, faculty and disability services. Um, and that can certainly be done in-house if you have someone who is, you know, willing to learn this stuff and do some training. Uh, you can even do some train the trainer. You can even uh, run training, have it recorded and then, um, you know, play it for other people. And then phase E is promote uh, accessibility compliance within the tertiary institution. So run frequent accessibility quest sessions, um, you know, lunch and learns and things like that, and develop case studies with of uh, how things have been made accessible within your organisation, uh, because that can really, you know, spur people on and go, hey, you know, it seems like an insurmountable problem, and yet they um, addressed it. So uh, if you uh, want to have a look at the paper, it goes into it in more detail. It's uh, tinyurl.com slash WP campus. Okay, so the next step is what about if there's no budget? And I know there's a lot of people who care a lot about accessibility uh, and they, they have no budget at all. Uh, so there are still quite a lot of things that you can do. So there are, you know, conferences, presentations, articles, um, free play media webinars, um, medium articles. And so I'm sorry, Leonard, who's putting these all into the chat. Uh, this is, <laughs> I have to close that. But first step is, so have a look at uh, the past conferences that we've done. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of stuff on mobile accessibility. Um, uh, you know, the tertiary institution stuff is here, the ICT accessibility testing symposium. So there's a lot of, um, you know, an accompanying journey, journey, well, a journal article uh, for an accessibility testing methodology, et cetera. And then we have uh, webinars. Uh, so a whole bunch of things uh, about, you know, the history of web accessibility. I've done some interviews with accessibility experts. Uh, some accessibility basics is really good if you are trying to learn right from the beginning uh, or, you know, you can send that around, maybe play that at a lunch and learn. Uh, then there are articles. We have articles on everything, um, you know, screen reader accessibility. So we have stuff here around, you know, blind dates, you know, problems with headings, HTML5 sectioning elements, uh, Firefox quantum and screen readers. Uh, so, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff there. And then 3Play has apparently no upcoming webinars. That's a bit of a concern. Um, but I'm sure that uh, they have previous webinars that you can access. And then there's Medium. Um, so a lot of people pu publish on uh, Medium and the other one that's taking over uh, that's more accessible. I've forgotten its name. Um, so, uh, you know, that's always a good place to look at too. Uh, then you've got, uh, then we go on to, uh, you can uh, basically go to the Athen Pro mailing list, uh, which that URL is not working. So I will find a better URL in a moment. But if you search for Athen and then mailing list, that's a mailing list specifically for uh, people who are in higher education and want to learn about accessibility. So if you have any questions, you can send it to that mailing list. Um, WebAIM also has a mailing list. Um, the Web Accessibility Interest Group also has a mailing group list. And of course, there's um, Twitter, uh, which is also uh, still around. Then we have uh, testing tools, instructional videos, etc. So WAVE, uh, we've got some developer videos, the accessibility switchboard and the accessibility fact sheets. So uh, basically, WAVE is really good. You just put in a URL there and it will tell you tell you the um, errors. Um, they're pretty easy to interpret. 
Uh, we did a series of 16 videos with California Community College's Tech Centre, uh, and these are all under five minutes. They're aimed at developers. They're on things like HTML, Forms, ARIA, like how not to use ARIA. People always use ARIA incorrectly. Uh, you know, keyboard focus, different focus orders, uh, error messages in Forms, et cetera. Uh, and then this is accessibility switchboard, which is great. And it's it's been created by a whole bunch of accessibility experts, including accessibility Oz. And there's a whole lot of um, resources and guidance around what kind of language should be in procurement, what you do if you have, um, you know, accessibility complaint, et cetera. Uh, so, and it's basically run by the National Federation for the Blind. So that's a, a really good resource uh, for tertiary institutions. Uh, then we have uh, the accessibility fact sheets. Um, so we have fact sheets on images, PDF, video, interactive maps, HTML5, content, JavaScript tables, coding, keyboard, source order, forms, and mobile. And I just want to show you, um, we have, you know, here kind of principles, impact on users, uh, developer checklist. And the developer checklist has correct and incorrect code, which is quite detailed when it comes to the JavaScript section. So for example, here, you can see the exact code for a progress um, meter and um, you know an actual demo. Uh, so that was that's really detailed and that's un available under Creative Commons. Uh, so you can grab that code and do whatever you like. Uh, then we have uh, I'm missing one thing here, which is uh, Bookshare, uh, but Grackle Docs and Able Player, and then Bookshare. So Grackle Docs is, um, you know, you, you can use it kind of once off um, as. Uh, you know, to create accessible documents, but, you know, your organisation would need to uh, purchase it for larger uh, installations. And then you've got Able Player, which is an accessible video player. And then this uh, is called Bookshare. And Bookshare is basically, uh, you can search for any kind of textbook um, and they, um, can give you a tagged version, uh, sometimes an audio version. Uh, so you just search for the title and uh, basically you can uh, access a lot of content for free there. Uh, then there's free conferences and meetups. Uh, there's a lot more than this, um, but, you know, the two uh, big ones really are the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, specific accessibility conferences, which is the third Thursday of each May, and web accessibility meetups. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, so Global Accessibility Awareness Day, uh, you know, is... Basically, there will be some event near you uh, um, in most cases. And then you have a whole bunch of accessibility meetups as well with 24,000 people and 38 groups. So if you have a teeny tiny budget, then the best bang for your buck is to send someone, maybe your accessibility champion, to a conference. So there's a bunch of different conferences. Um, there's CSUN uh, in Anaheim, Los Angeles in March. There's Access U uh, in May, which is online. Uh, there's the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium in Washington, D.C. in October. Um, and sometimes these dates move around a little. But if you can only go to one, go to Accessing Higher Ground in Denver, Colorado. And they are um, offering online um, uh, you know, access. I'm actually doing two uh, virtual training sessions this year, uh, how to manage the build of an accessible website and mobile accessibility. So if you have one, you know, if you don't go to one conference, that is the one to go to. Um, then there's M Enabling Summit and the, uh, if you want, uh, there's the IAAP webinars. So basically, um, this conference, CSUN, started out basically as just kind of providing physical accommodations, uh, you know, software, software technology, um, and built 
uh, grew into web accessibility. It's the largest of all the web accessibility conferences, um, has a massive exhibit hall. Um, uh, so that might be something that you're interested in. I will just say I caught COVID there in 2023. So I'm a little bit wary of it now, but it is absolutely the biggest. Um, John Slayton is great, especially if you're looking the Access U for more technical stuff. Um, ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium, it's for testers. Um, if you, it's all in the name. Uh, and Accessing Higher Ground uh, is all about uh, accessibility in tertiary education. So that is absolutely um, the best conference out there. M enabling is more at, you know, aimed at policymakers. Uh, and uh, IAP is the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And they do have some really good detailed webinars, but you do have to pay for them. Um, as I said before, you can access the uh, paper. I keep showing you because I know what it's like. I look at, you know, start a presentation. Well, I don't want that paper. And then halfway through, you think, well, maybe I do. So thank you very much for your time. As I said, you can read the paper, shiningurl.com slash WP Campus. There's heaps of information. Um, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. You mentioned that uh, disability services could do outreach because maybe people are a little scared. Um, what are the types of things that like you can tell people at your institution to be like, no, come, you know, we can help you instead of just here's all our policy. You have to follow it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, great question. Um, we really, I suppose, turned the dial in Montgomery County Community College when we did that um, lecture where we had uh, me speak and we had disability services speak. Um, and But the thing is, we forced faculty to come, which was a big kerfuffle, because if you're from a community college, you can't really force, you know, faculty to do anything. Um, so there was a, a lot of toing and froing before that. Um, and uh, I think that that's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is through case studies. Um, and it's just a case of communicating those case studies. Um, so making sure there may be in, you know, at Monash University, we had a, a campus newsletter, um, making sure they're in that. Um, it is, it is very difficult. And, you know, some people will just put their head in the sand until they get a student with a disability. Um, so the that's that's what I would recommend um, as much as possible. And you can also force it a lot from the top down. Uh, so when executive get involved and say, this is the way we have to do things now, and there is some money behind it, then people might think, oh, well, you, you can kind of convince them that, you know, oh, you won't have to do that because there's money behind it now. So disability services will take that on, even though disability services was always doing that. That can be a way to kind of, you know, reset the system and sort of say, hey, you know, you don't need to worry about this. But yes, it is definitely, um, it is difficult. I was, I was stunned, quite frankly, at how um, reticent the faculty were to talk to to disability services um and i i looking back i think i think that it definitely occurred at monash as well except i was in it so i didn't see it as much um but yes the faculty seem to think that disability services you know are only ever on the side of the student which of course is what they are supposed to do but they also have skills that can you know assist the faculty by you know taking the load off so yeah i hope that answered your question